Hello, everybody. Good, good. All right. You ready? Please. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of Barry Ostrowski, the president and CEO of RWJ Barnabas Health, I would like to welcome you all to today's event. My name is Warren Moore, and I have this, the distinct honor and privilege to serve as President and CEO of Children's Specialized Hospital. Children's Specialized is a leading provider of care for children facing special health care challenges, and at our 13 different locations throughout New Jersey, our pediatric specialists partner with families to make our many innovative therapies and medical treatments more personalized and effective. At RWJ Barnabas Health, our primary mission is to build healthier communities. And in order to accomplish this and to effectuate meaningful change, we understand that we must address the social determinants of health as well. And those determinants also include education and economic stability, among, among other things. We commend the administration for its strong commitment and renewed focus on workforce development and apprenticeship programs. As we know and have seen firsthand, workforce development initiatives, including apprenticeships, have paved the career pathways for many of our own employees here at Children's Specialized. I am pleased that several of our program participants are here to join us today. This is not possible without continuing support of our health system, which has a strong and rich history in its dedication to building career ladders for employees, strengthening efforts to engage those employees, and promoting economic stability and career development, which supports the long-term sustainability and the health of our workforce. It's now my pleasure to introduce Governor Phil Murphy. Thank you, Warren. Well done, Warren. Thank you, Warren. It is a real treat to be here. Could you all forgive me a minute or two on an unrelated matter, if I could? Um, we're going to experience, in fact, we are experiencing several days of extreme heat as we head into and through the entire weekend. The latest forecasts are predicting Temperatures in the mid to upper 90s statewide, but with humidity factored in, it will feel well, and I underscore well, in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Certainly, we want everyone to enjoy their weekends, but more importantly, we want everyone to be safe. It's going to be just as hot at the shore, by the way, as it will be in the mountains. If you or someone else needs access to a cooling center, uh, please immediately call 211, 211 or visit nj211.org, that's nj211.org, or go to nj211 on both Facebook or Twitter. So the operative number's there, you got them? 211. <laughs> For everyone, be sure to stay hydrated, stay in an air-conditioned place, and cut back on any strenuous outdoor activity, and learn the signs of heat exhaustion or heat stroke, including and especially among folks at both ends of the spectrum, the very young and the very elderly, and use common sense. If you have older family members and neighbors or know anyone with a chronic health condition, please take a moment to check in on them to make sure they're safe. Also, keep it, as, a, as the owner of two dogs and a bird, also keep an eye on your pets, and don't leave any pets in a parked car, and certainly don't leave any kids in a parked car. If you see a pet left unattended in a vehicle, uh, please call local police immediately to report it. In addition to the heat, we're going to have some pretty nasty thunderstorms, I think, e even today, even potentially this afternoon. Uh, we had some power outages overnight. I know our team was in touch with the mayor of Ewing, and by example, which had a bunch out. So if there are down power lines as a result of that, again, please don't go near the line and don't, don't assume anybody else has called it in. Call it in if you could or if your own power is out. Again, there's plenty of information available by calling 211, visiting nj211.org, or going to nj211 on both Facebook or Twitter. Okay, I'll do that. So you got that, right? Yes. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for letting me get that, uh, get that out. And again, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. And uh, I want to join Warren and Rob and welcoming and the whole team here, welcoming everybody to, to New Brunswick. Thank you, Warren, for that introduction uh, and for your leadership. This is an extraordinary institution. Thanks as well to Children's Specialized Hospital and everyone at RW, RWJ Barnabas Health for hosting us, and I might add, hosting us on short notice. Um, I'm honored, in addition to me standing beside Warren, I'm honored to be here alongside the Commissioner of Labor and Workforce Development. You'll hear from him in a minute, Rob Angelo. 
So today, uh, timing is everything. We welcomed the best jobs numbers in our state's history. Today, New Jersey can boast of an unemployment rate of 3.5%. That is the lowest ever seasonably adjusted rate since the state began its current record keeping in 1976. That's lower than when our economy was roaring in the 1980s. It is lower when we were riding high on the dot-com wave in the 1990s. Nearly 4.3 million New Jerseyans today are working, a gain of more than 10,000 from just May to June of this year, and more than 45,000 gained over the past year. Since our administration took office in January 2018, so that's about a year and a half, private sector employment has grown by over 61,000 jobs. What these numbers show clearly is that our efforts to grow our economy the right way are paying real dividends. And let me remind everybody, our work is far, far from finished, but the journey is clearly headed in the right direction. This journey begins with a focus on investing in education and workforce development, and in particular, in apprenticeship programs that are pipelines to good jobs. The biggest need of business talent or a business, rather, uh, of any size or any, any type, is talent. And in a tightening labor market, we're doing all we can to fully develop both talent pipelines for employers and, at the same time, career pathways for employees. This is, in fact, the reason we're here at Children's Specialized Hospital, because of the growing partnership between RWJ Barnabas Health, on the one hand, and the Department of Labor, on the other hand, and on 80 apprenticeships in the healthcare field, including lab technologists, paramedics, and patient care positions. And all those apprentices will be earning both a minimum wage of $15 an hour, and if that weren't enough, college credits toward either an associate's or a bachelor's of science degree. We are investing in our workers by raising many of their wages, with many more to come guaranteeing paid sick days, expanding family leave programs, strengthening equal pay protections, and supporting and growing apprenticeships and other work-based learning. The jobs numbers today prove the importance of having an actual strategy when it comes to economic growth. We are investing in all the things that make our state great, our people, our location, our values, and our infrastructure, to name just a few. Our economy is becoming stronger because it is becoming fairer. All of this paints a strong contrast with the last administration's legacy of cutting education funding, cutting workforce development funding, and cutting mass transit funding, an agenda that believed only in showering the richest and biggest players with huge and unsustainable tax breaks that did not trickle down and left too many shut out. Many experts are already sounding the warnings of a potential economic downturn. Those warnings are all the more reason we need to take action to secure our economic future by investing in tomorrow and putting in place the sustainable economic and fiscal practices we need to weather any recession. New Jersey was ravaged by the last recession, in no small part because we simply weren't prepared. We can't be caught flat-footed again. I remain committed to the fiscal values that this administration has put forward, values of targeted investment in our people and responsible fiscal management. But today we can say confidently that New Jersey is moving in the right direction, with more of our people working than ever before at any time in our history. And we're doing so with strong partners like RWJ Barnabas Health. And that is indeed all of this good news. And it inspires me to continue working hard with Rob and our entire team to keep up that momentum. Thank you very much again for hosting us and being with us today. It is now my pleasure to turn the podium over to the Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, Rob Acero Angelo. Thanks, man.
Good afternoon, everybody. So happy to be here. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Warren, and the whole Children's Specialized team. I'm not biased because my kids were both born here, but it's a great place. Uh, not just for having us here today, uh, but for all RWJ Barnabas does for the health of our communities and the health of our state's workforce. We talk a lot about the social determinants of health. Uh, Dr. Richard Besser, the President and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, wrote in their Building a Culture of Health report, quote, differences in health are often the result of policies and decisions that shape a place, its neighborhoods, its schools, its streets and highways, its programs and services, its access to good paying jobs, essentially its opportunities for good health. So I'm so proud to be part of a Murphy administration that has taken so many positive steps on all these fronts, whether it's the Department of Ed increasing funding for early childhood education around the state, or Adobe transitioning us to a state exchange and codifying parts of the ACA, our Department of Human Services and Children and Families and the First Lady's Office working collaboratively with community partners on family festivals around the state to connect our residents with available programs. For us at the Department of Labor, we work every day to ensure New Jerseyans have access to good paying jobs. The days of looking for just a job are over. We want New Jerseyans to have well paying, family supporting careers where they can take advantage of advancement opportunities like we're highlighting today. RWJ has been innovating and developing career pathways long before I became commissioner, and they have served as a successful example to New Jersey businesses, large and small, on how to not just be a successful enterprise, but an employer invested in the future and well-being of its employees, their families, and their communities. I've got to give a shout-out to Lourdes Valdez right here. Lourdes Valdez, when I first started as commissioner, I came and met with her uh, at RWJ Barnabas up, up north, and she laid out all the programs that they're working on, how the second someone walks through the door, they're already being trained for their next level up. And that's the kind of advancement we need for every career in this state, working across different sectors, working across different geographies, and RWJ is a great example of that. Amen. But it's not just community-minded healthcare systems like RWJ making this commitment. Apprenticeships are going across the state. And it's a great view here from the hub city of New Brunswick, the innovation hub of the state. Right down Einstein Alley, some might know it as Route 1, at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, our New Jersey Apprenticeship Network just announced three new programs on, to further fusion energy research. Right up Route 1, the governor announced the first round of our apprentice, apprentice grantees back in February at Sandstone Auto Group, where he did an announcement about the snow, not That's the heat, uh, who is hiring auto and diesel mechanic apprentices right now. Right down Route 18 at Monmouth County Vocational and Technical Schools, they've just started a Greenskeeper and Sports Turf Management Apprenticeship Program. That's one of my favorite ones, Governor, because we had nothing to do with it. It was totally organic. But because the investment we're making in the state, you being at a microphone talking about the importance of apprenticeship, makes people want to get on board. It makes employers want to get on board. It makes workers want to get on board. And this investment has turned into reality for a lot of workers here in New Jersey. When we took office 18 months and two days ago, Governor, there were 626 registered apprenticeship programs in the state. Now we have 836 in the state, a 34% uptick. Success begets success. It's because of these investments that our department and many of our partners, including the Council of County Colleges, their member schools across the state, the German American Chamber of Commerce, Siemens, UPS, NGIT, were recently awarded millions of dollars from the U.S. Department of Labor to keep our foot on the gas in this historic expansion. These investments across the state by employers concerned not just with their bottom line, but with the health and security of their workers, their families, and their communities are going a long way to make us a fairer and stronger New Jersey. Thank you. Well said, man. Thank you. 18 months and two years. Good point. Um, Rob and I, you know, Rob, just want to say this, Warren, thank you again for hosting us and for all the extraordinary work you do. Rob worked for the Obama administration, Secretary of Labor Tom Perez, who's a good friend of not only him but myself, and the minute we met, we bonded. And one of the things we bonded on was apprenticeship programs. And, and the back story for me is I was the U.S. ambassador to Germany. And Germany, I think, is the world, I think we agree, the world leader in the notion of apprenticeships. Uh, and and we're, it's, it's, it's coming alive. Uh, it has existed in our state really well inside of the building trades for decades, but not much outside of that. And that is changing dramatically. And, and being with you today is a, is a great example of that. So thank you both, guys. Take any quick questions, if you got them. Brett? You, uh, you met with uh, Sweeney and Coughlin today. Any the Senate president and the speaker, Brett? Fair enough. I'm speaking like a journalist. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, any progress, especially on, on the tax incentive uh, situation? And the, the 
I'll, I'll leave the specifics out. You'll forgive me. That it was a private conversation, but it was a good one. It was constructive, frank, open, cordial. Please. Yes. Russo, the, uh, the effort is on the way to remove him. And I'm good, by the way. Training for all okay. judges in the state. Um, I know that you've been a little hesitant to make specific comments as to whether, you know, a couple of weeks ago you didn't want to talk about whether the judges should be removed. Um, but with regard to Judge Silva, where no action has been taken, what's your sense about um, your feeling that whether you would uh, reappoint her? Or I know she's got to be confirmed, but yep. would that happen? So. Just to, to, for, for folks who may not have been following this, uh, what I've said about these judges has been pretty consistent, and I'll just repeat a little of it. Number one, the comments were abhorrent, unacceptable, completely inconsistent with both uh, the survivor-centric state that we believe we are and must continue to be on the one hand, and also a state with a judiciary which is a national, I used this phrase last evening, gold standard. So those comments are completely discordant, unacceptable, uh, period. Uh, secondly, but I also said I don't want to become, I don't want to trump institutions the way our president does with whether it's the Federal Reserve or whatever else it might be. And there's a process within the judiciary that I believe we need to respect. As, as, as angry as I might be, a process exists. And as you rightfully have pointed out, it, of, of the three judges that have been talked about the most, that process has come to fruition very quickly, I might add, for two of them. Um, I will withhold judgment on the third, but certainly if it, were, if it were to come to a reappointment question, comments like that, if you ask me, would comments like that factor into whatever decision I, and deliberation I came to? The answer is absolutely yes, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll come to that at the moment in time when that's, when that's active. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to re repeat with my, my top line, we will fix NJ Transit if it kills me, and it might. Uh, but we will fix NJ Transit. Uh, and we have no choice. Uh, we are the densest state in the nation, and moving people around is existential to our economy and our society. We secondly, we inherited an awful mess. If, if, the, if New Jersey is the turnaround story of America, the turnaround story within New Jersey's turnaround is NJ Transit. And that's everything from the wrong management to the state gutting its support to not having enough engineers year over year, or, or, or over many years rather, to not adhering and not keeping up with federal safety standards. We've addressed all of those. So we have the right management. The budget I signed is an all-time high historic investment from the state. We have not one, two, three, four, five, but six classes of rail engineers this year alone, one of which has already graduated. We met a huge federal safety hurdle that no one thought we could meet. Uh, there's no question in the aggregate the data is getting better. The June numbers we're still trying to analyze, I have to say myself. I don't have a complete answer on the specifics of June. But in the aggregate, the data is getting better. But if you're a commuter and, and your train didn't show up or it was late and you're frustrated, I don't blame you. You should be frustrated and so am I. I will not rest, we will not rest until we bat 1,000. Last point, the summer is more complicated. I believe you and I have had this exchange, but it was last year. Uh, the summer is more complicated. Uh, because the last administration allowed the pool of engineers to thin so much, it's not surprising when your kids are off from school, you're more likely to be taking a long weekend or a vacation in the summer. Amtrak does its, uh, the bulk of its uh, annual uh, uh, work on its assets in the summer. Uh, we have a very good relationship with them, unlike the last administration, but even then, there's only so much you can do. We're still suffering from the ARC tunnel getting canceled and the Trump administration not yet funding the Gateway Project. So even when we could, could control everything that we could control, we can't control that which is outside of our control. But I would say slowly but surely, we are going to get this fixed. You, you, we'll see, by the way.
Well, as usual, they're wrongheaded and they're playing out of the Trump playbook, so bless their hearts, good luck with that. Uh, they're factually completely wrong, with all due respect. Uh, I'm very proud of the directives that our Attorney General put out some number of months ago, which, uh, and by the way, he did it, there was a reason he did it alongside and with the support of police chiefs up and down the state that basically said our law enforcement would prioritize criminal activities uh, instead of uh, prioritizing or participating in any way in immigration activities. And here's the reason. It's very common sense, very much common sense. If, if you are a resident and you feel comfortable to come out of the shadows into the sunlight in your community and engage with your neighbors, engage with your community activists, your faith leaders, your elected officials, and importantly, with law enforcement, the overwhelming evidence, the overwhelming conclusion is that is a safer community. Not just for the folks who came out of the shadows, but for the rest of the folks who are already out of the shadows. So I categorically and completely disagree with them. Before I come back to you, uh, are you in the press? Okay, one second, sir. Brenda, we'll go to you first. So you asked me about this the other day, and I, and I was going to come back to you and say that I know that NJ Transit explicitly dedicated a bucket of money toward that. I've not, I've not uh, read or heard the majority leader's quote. And, and I don't, but my, my quick reaction, Brenda, is we, we have to be in an and-both state and not an either-or. Uh, we clearly have to get the 900,000 commuters to work in school or wherever they're headed safely, reliably, and home. Uh, on time. There's no question that's job number one. But the, as you and I discussed the other day, this is going to be a massive operation. It's going to have, when it's fully leased, and I don't think it will be on day one, no project like that ever is, I think it's going to have 16,000 employees, never mind the thousands who go there every day. Uh, and that will put a big strain in the Bergen County and Hudson systems and roads at a minimum. And so I think we should be and both. I don't think it should be one or the other. Bikini. Sorry. Uh, so, no, first, I apologize. I'll come back to you. Uh, I was just wondering, is there, are there any Democrats in the state of congressional voting? Do you want to come to the door? You keep asking a similar question, but with a different group now? Yeah. Listen, I view myself categorically as the titular, if not the actual head of the Democratic Party in the state of New Jersey, and I'm proud to support Democrats for re-election. Please. Yes, no. Was that the question you were going to ask? No, no. no I, d I doubt that. Can you remind me of the bill? Is this to, to increase the, the required referendum from 10%? No, not that I know of. Um, a simple one for me. I'm not sure. The, are you sure there wasn't a statement that was put out? Because we normally do. Okay. So Aliana's saying there wasn't. I'm not sure why that wasn't. Uh, very simple rationale from my standpoint, without knowing the details in the Mount Laurel uh, specifics. Uh, heretofore, the requirement was that 10 per, a referendum could go forward with 10% of the population, and I think that's too little. Uh, and so this, re this bill, among other things, raises the re minimum requirement to 25%. And that feels to me like a broader participation, and that to me is usually good for democracy. Please. Governor, I think this could be the last one. Is that all right? Okay, please. Follow on the NJ Transit question. You pointed out we do have a shortage of engineers for years, and we're trying to make up for yep. that. Bearing that in mind, there have been suggestions that perhaps the schedule could be pared down a bit, especially on the weekends, because we keep writing into these situations where they're canceling some of the dirty trains on the weekend because there are not enough engineers. So until we reach some kind of a critical mass, yep. would it make sense in your line to decrease the number of, because what happens is people make plans and then the train yep. gets and, 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 they, and they get mad, and I don't blame them. And, and, and frustration probably is the low-end emotion that they, they, they have, and I don't blame them. Uh, I'm not running the operation, so I, I don't want to come in and pretend that I'm an uh, I'm a expert uh, on this, although I'm fast becoming one. Uh, 
I, I would say this, it's July, as Rob reminded me, it's July 18th, one of our children's birthday, by the way. Uh, uh, yes, I do know which one, thank you, it's our son Josh's, <laughs> he, who wasn't born here, by the way, uh, but thanks for asking. Uh, he's 22 today, God bless him. Um, uh, it's July 18th. There's a different world because of the Amtrak configuration and because of school vacation and whatnot. There's a different world six weeks from now. So what we do in the next six weeks, I got to leave to the experts and the specialists. It's a fair common sense question, I admit to you, uh, but I'll leave it to the experts to try to square all that. I want to say again, Warren, to you and your extraordinary team here uh, at this extraordinary children's hospital, Thank you so much for having us. It's a, an incredible treat. Thank you for the cooperation on the apprenticeship programs that, that, that are really special, uh, particularly the so-called gains area, which is the non-traditional apprenticeship programs. Rob, to you and your team, uh, great work. Uh, and again, we're on a journey. Uh, we're digging out of an economic mess, but we're clearly putting runs on the board. We're not spiking the football by any means. Uh, but this is the biggest increase in jobs month over month in our state's history in the private sector, overwhelmingly in the private sector. It's the lowest unemployment rate in our state's history. We have to at least acknowledge that, that, that whatever journey we're on, whatever the mix of policies that we're putting forward is having an impact. And I think our collective job is to stay at it and to, get, to continue on that journey together. Thank you all very much and stay cool, everybody. Great stuff. Great stuff here. We'd love that. Who do it right here? Yeah, we're going to take oh, it. Oh, over here. Right? Yeah.